So anyhow, uh, I will repeat my favorite introduction to me from all time was one given to me by Frank Easterbrook. Captain By was there at the Federal Society meeting, which was held to a very large crowd um, on, um, in, I guess it was in February. And what she said about me, she said, Frank said, Richard Epstein needs no introduction, therefore I shall give him none. Um, and I think that's just fine. Now, the second part is there. The first part may be false. But anyhow, I mean, it is nice to see some familiar faces. It's also um, nice to see some unfamiliar faces. I am a transient bird of passage when it comes to my involvement with the University of Chicago. And every year I come back and I wonder, will everybody have forgotten me in the interim? And it's nice to know not completely. And with that as a formal introduction, the topic today, if somebody could remind me, has to do, I think, with the notion of expectations as they are used in law, and whether or not these expectations are reasonable or unreasonable. This topic may sound as a kind of abstruse and perhaps unduly confusing type of problem, but in fact, when you actually track the way in which the problem emerges through the case law and through the academic and philosophical literature, it turns out that it presents a very large and powerful challenge, and it also turns out that most of the received solutions today, I think, are less than wise in the way in which they organize the problem, at least in some, but not in all cases. And so the first thing that one wants to do when you're looking about this is to ask why it is that you pick on this particular topic, reasonable and unreasonable expectations, for a discussion. And, and what happens is most of you are now law students, so your minds have been thoroughly decided. Every time you sort of think of a question, you think about how it will come out in Socratic discourse. And so if you want to talk about causation, you will be told quite confidently that it has a myriad of meanings, none of which are fully clear. If you want to talk about the term possession, and it is a term shrouded in mystery, uh, you could say the same thing with virtually every term that you use. On the other hand, when you get out of the classroom and you walk down the corridor and you see somebody coming, you turn to the left and somebody else goes to the right, and you said, why did you do that? And I said, well, I expected him to go on that side, and I thought it was reasonable for me to go on the other side of the road. And so what happens is you have the following very strange disjunction when it comes to language. All of you are perfectly good native speakers of at least one language. Um, and when terms like this come up in day-to-day -day conversation, you don't think twice, even once, about the way in which they work. It's also clear that, to some extent, you actually communicate with one another. And the proof of that is in the pudding. As you walk down the streets, you just don't go tumbling and crashing into everybody. Uh, somehow or other, you're able to make these accommodations in common space by making these kinds of an adjustment. And I think that there is a very powerful philosophical lecture to be learned from this, which is, if you're going to be a realist, be a realist in the moral tradition, not in the legal tradition. A moral legalist is somebody who says that various kinds of normative terms have clear and understandable meanings if you only work hard enough to find them. And a legal realist has exactly the opposite point of view, treats all of this effort to get terminological exactness as a charade for some kind of policy judgment, which is very difficult to defend um, in its own uh, proper terms. And what I'm going to tell you is better to be the moral realist when it comes to language than to be the legal realist. That basically, when you see a term that's in common use, your job is to figure out why it works, not to figure out why it can't work. And that requires that you spend a lot of attention on both the good and the bad cases. Now, when you bring this into the legal system, you have an enormous advantage over the philosophers, which is what happens is you actually have concrete cases that have to be decided. And at least in the Anglo-American tradition, you have to give explicit reasons for why it is that you're trying to decide the particular case in a particular way. Uh, so what you ought to do is to think of cases and their reasoning as kind of data points, and your job is to look at a fair sample of them and to figure out whether or not you can organize them in a way that are more satisfactory than the cases, or to explain why the cases as they are are perfectly satisfactory. And one of the terms that does appear in many of these cases, particularly in the Penn Central case, is this funny term investment-backed expectations. And you start looking at it, and the first thing you should do is, to some extent, smell a rat. And now, why do I say that? Well, it is a common matter of constitutional interpretation that you interpret the terms that are in the particular document rather than interpret the terms that are not in the document. 
And if you look at the takings clause, which was the subject of examination in that particular opinion, it says relatively categorically, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The words investment backed expectations, reasonable expectations, and so forth, are no part of the particular clause. And so the question then is, why would you want to read them in instead of starting with the terms as they exist? And there is, for Justice Brennan, at least in that opinion, a very clear agenda uh, that leads him to make the switch from the terms that are found inside the Constitution and inside the state law to the terms that, in fact, he brings to explain how these things are put together. Many justices on the Supreme Court are what we would call result-oriented. And what we mean by that is they see certain <coughs> kinds of institutions that they approve of, and their view is that they will not tolerate that certainly not encourage any kind of constitutional attack that brings these institutions into some kind of question. And if you are like Justice Brennan, a New Jersey Democrat liberal who gets onto the Supreme Court by kind of a fluke when Eisenhower appoints him just before the 1956 election, one of the things that it turns out you like are landmark preservation law. These are widely spread out throughout the United States. They certainly respond to a series of crises that do require some degree of attention. In New York City, the reason these laws were first introduced is that somebody decided to rip down the beautiful old Madison Square Garden facility in 1963, much to public distress, and then by 1965, uh, the city council and Mayor Robert F. Wagner, the son of the Senator Wagner from some years before, passed the Landmark Preservation Act which makes sure that for certain kinds of designated properties, this kind of thing could not be done. You would have to go through some planning approval and some public process before this could happen. And if, in fact, you believe that this process turns out to be an appropriate process properly run, the general view that you're going to take is that constitutional objections uh, that scotch or destroy the particular institution that you find favor with ought to be discussed. And so the question then comes is, how do you square this with the constitutional protection? And it turns out you come out with totally different analyses, depending upon whether you stick to the clause as it's written, or if, in fact, you take the gloss on the clause, which immediately starts to move in terms of a reasonable or unreasonable expectation. So let's just take this particular problem and run it through both hands. The first point in the standard analysis of takings and property law in the United States is a federalism question, oddly enough. But what you do is you have a federal constitution, and it's engrafted on a system of state property rights law, which are created in this instance by New York State. And the justices always come to the conclusion, correct in my view, uh, that the question of what the entitlements are are generally to be interpreted as a matter of state law. And then what the federal constitution does, once you've identified the property interest, is to figure out how the public use and the just compensation provisions kick into those protected rights, and also how it ties in to the most amorphous head of all property rights jurisprudence, the police power, which gives a government, particularly at the state level, a kind of a paramount power to regulate for the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the, of the population. So if you want to take this particular framework, what is it going to tell you? Well, the first thing it's going to tell you is that the Penn Central case does not present any unique challenge to the system of property rights. What happened in that case is that you had a terminal which was engaged in sort of normal operations. One knew what its costs were. One knew the amount of those costs that had been recovered. It was perfectly clear, and Justice Brennan is surely right about this, that if the terminal continued to operate in the way in which it had always done, it would not fall into bankruptcy, and in fact the investors with respect to the property would be able to get a reasonable rate of return on the initial investment, certainly a more than reasonable rate of return after you take depreciation into account. At which point what he does is he goes into Alfred E. Newman mode and asks the question, what me worry? Why should I worry about the application of a law if it's not going to disrupt the current operations and the settled expectations, he says, of the terminal in question. The property rights law, however, takes a very different view of this subject. At issue in this particular case was not the operation of the terminal, but whether or not a fancy <coughs> tower designed by a famous French architect named Marcel Breuer could be built over the terminal, a straddling park avenue. 
This would be the second terminal over the Penn Central building. The first one was the then Pan Am building, and it was, of course, sufficiently large and impressive either to constitute the view up and down Park Avenue or to block the view up and down Park Avenue, depending upon the taste that you have on that issue. And the Breuer Tower would be a second tower where the first had already come. And the Planning Commission looked at this thing, and it decided that it did not want this particular building to be put up in that particular space because it was inconsistent with the character of the neighborhood, and they thought it would be a detriment to tourism and a variety of other situations. One of the things that they did not say about this building was that it would fall down during construction. Another thing that they did not say about this building is that it would emit all sorts of terrible odors that would be a huge insult to the neighborhood of which it was a part. The judgment was ultimately one of character and one of aesthetic. Now, if you start looking at this, what happens is they say, essentially, you cannot build there. What have they done? And under classic law, it turns out that the key to understanding how property works is that you take a kind of a single conglomerate interest called the fee simple absolute in possession, which has a spatial dimension that goes from, quote unquote, the center of the earth up to the heavens, and a temporal dimension, which essentially goes indefinitely. And what you then do is subject it to certain constraints with respect to neighbors, which is the purpose of the nuisance law that we've talked about before, and say that within that particular domain, the given individual has the exclusive possession, the exclusive right of use, the exclusive right of disposition, and the exclusive right of development of the particular parcel in question. Are there gains from trade that come in this particular universe is that you can divide this parcel into multiple ways so that, in fact, the sum of the parts exceed the value of the whole, even after you take into account transactions. So if you look at virtually any complicated building in New York City or anywhere else, what you will find quite happily is that there are mortgages on the property, there are servitudes going in and out of the property, there are covenants restricting its use one way or another, there are leases that take place, there are subleases that take place, so that the whole thing essentially is split into smaller and smaller parts. And this is an entirely benevolent process. So long as this process does not create nuisances, does not result in tiles falling down, we're pretty confident that the sum of the parts is greater than the value of the whole if the particular division is going to take place. And if this is the particular situation, then uh, the correct analysis under this view of the takings clause is it tracks what the private law of New York State does with respect to these property interests. And if the air rights over the Grand Central Terminal are separate, if they can be sold for a market value, if they can be developed, if they can be mortgaged, if they can be leased, if they can be given away, uh, they quack like a duck and they sound like a duck, so therefore they are a duck, it's a property. <coughs> so what happens is, under this analysis, New York City is put to a choice, which is to, it's somewhat unpleasant. It can certainly decide that it's going to condemn the air rights for their fair market value, or it could let the construction go forward. What it cannot do under this particular analysis is to say we don't want the building to go forward. We will take the air rights, but we will pay absolutely nothing for it. Uh, so that under these circumstances, what happens is there is now a fiscal constitution which organizes the way in which the state can, in fact, run its particular operation. I regard this as a benevolent rather than a difficult reason. And the explanation, strangely enough, has to do with the of various operations of democratic politics. Uh, generally speaking, if the government wanted to take the land outright, it would have to pay compensation. And that means there would be a public deliberation as to whether or not the land that was taken was worth the price that you take it for. And if you could take it for zero, you'll always take too much, which means that a dominant faction can wipe out a faction that is smaller and less powerful than it would otherwise be. And so when people start talking about the just compensation clause as the bulwark of our liberty, what they mean is that it is a protection against various kinds of intrigue, various kinds of factors. There is nothing about this particular logic that applies to the fee simple that does not carry over uh, to the restricted air rights in question. And so what you do when you put the compensation formula in there is you say this landowner cannot hold out for whatever it is he thinks he can get, but he can get the fair market value of these rights as they would trade in an ordinary private situation. The local folks could decide whether or not to take it, and if they decide to take it, they pay and they have their air rights. If not, they don't. What typically happens when you put a price on something like this 
is all of a sudden people get very nervous about the situation. And they say, wait, you know, we already have lost the view going up and down Pennsylvania, or rather Park Avenue. Uh, how much are we losing there? Besides, this tower may be a rather attractive building. Anyhow, do we really think it's worth $3 million to take it up? And usually the difference between a regulatory body acting unilaterally under delegated powers will be quite different from those of a democratic process, which has to fully internalize the court. Now, Justice Brennan is very much a believer in this other model of expert specialized agencies making judgments independent of financial constraints that deal with the soft virtues and the character of a particular city. The question is, how does he get there? And the way in which he gets there is to essentially dismantle the property model that exists under private law and put in a reasonable expectations model, an investment back expectations model in the place. So what's the first strategy that you use in order to achieve this result? What happens is you engage not in moral realism, but in legal realism. And you announce quite grandly that trying to figure out what the proper interface is between the takings clause on the one hand um, and the private rights of owners on the other is something which nobody's been able to solve. It's all a matter of ad hoc rules. And if, of course, they're a matter of ad hoc rules, then in effect that almost inevitably leads to a level of deference which would be higher than you would do if, in fact, you applied the rather mechanical model that I talked about before, which has, just to stress, desirable features precisely because it is a mechanical model and it reduces the level of political distress. Then what he does is he dismantles the profit and he announces to the rest of the world that it is simply indefensible for somebody to start thinking about property on an interest by interest basis, you always have to think about the parcel as a whole. And at this particular point, all the gains from trade that are registered by division somehow or other can now be ignored by the state when it deals with the compensation crisis. And this is a terrible mistake because it means that if you have gains from trade and the government decides to condemn the land, the gains that you've got from the trade will be ignored and you can condemn the thing at a lower cost. And then to go even further, he says, it's not what you take under these particular circumstances, it's what you have left that matters. Now, how does he get to that point? He uses the investment back expectation lever as a way to run the transaction. So what he does, in effect, is he says in the passive voice that if you look at a particular piece of property which is already developed, it must be regarded that the primary expectation was that you would be able to continue the use that you have without government interference. And so therefore, if in fact that particular investment back that expectation is satisfied, the rest of it simply does not matter. And the result of that particular maneuver is that the secondary kind of expectation you have, the ability to sell and to use the air rights in a conficient fashion, are no longer to be protected because they do not fall within this rather narrow and cramped definition of what is an investment bank expectation. And so what you do is you now see a complete inversion from the old private law system, a perfectly marketable interest in development rights subject to the usual constraints to protect against neighbor is now rendered something of zero value by virtue of the use of this particular term in this particular context. Well, you know, you say to yourself, well, is this a good or a bad thing uh, for us to allow this? And as far as he's concerned, the sort of generalized social benefits mean that it's a perfectly good thing uh, that we allow this. And so therefore, he sticks with his particular definition. Now, what you have to understand about definitions when they're wrong, just as when they're right, is that they have a genuine generative capacity, meaning, in effect, that if you can apply them incorrectly in one case, uh, you can apply them incorrectly in another case. And so what happens is this whole formula starts to break down in a whole variety of areas moving forward with respect to what happens. Uh, the first thing that we discover is, in many cases, it turns out that there is no existing use which generates a return which allows you to recover your cost in question. And so the only expectations that you have are expectations of development rights of some sort or another. Uh, do we now, thinking the way Justice Brennan talked, say, aha, since the development rights are the only rights that you have, well, it turns out that you can now exercise them into the full because you've got nothing else that's left. And the answer that has always been given in this particular case is no. And the reason is because they now follow a distinction that Justice Brennan introduced into the law, which has created immense amounts of confusion. And that's the distinction between a so-called physical taking 
for which compensation is fully required, and a regulatory taking, which is subject to a, quote, ad hoc balancing test in which you look at the nature of the interest that is sacrificed and look at the government interest that is advanced on the other side and come to the conclusion that if there's no physical invasion, uh, then the level of protection is given is very low. If there is a physical invasion, then it's going to be much higher. And the first question you want to ask is, if I cannot use my air rights, is that a physical invasion of the space by the government, or is it just simply saying, you can't use it and we won't use it either? Well, it turns out that this then gives rise to another complication, which is very much in the news right now in New York City, and this is the institution known as the transferable development right. Justice Brennan does not say development rights are compensable, but he says, oh, by the way, you know, you do have these transferable air rights that you could attach to some other parcel. If you could find somebody who's going to sell you the stuff on the ground, he says, I don't know what they're worth. Come to think about it, I don't know how you got them in the first place. But if you want to put those things into the situation, it's not really as bad as it looks, because what's happened is you've gotten something in exchange for what you've lost. You will note that what you get in exchange is not just compensation for what you've lost. In the sense, it doesn't leave you indifferent between what you have and the money that you receive. And more to the point, it turns out these things, since they have to be sold or used on another parcel, are extremely difficult to value. And so we go right back again to our doctrine of government clarity. And the answer in all cases is the government should never be allowed to compensate people in funny money which is hard to value. What it wants to do is to compensate them in cash, and then if there are transferable development rights, it can sell them off independently in the market where they get a true valuation. But if, in fact, you allow the valuation and the compensation function to emerge, you will always get the wrong result. So again, I'm stressing the point uh, that if you have strong systems of clear property rights, you get better democratic governance, not worse democratic governance, when you start to deal with these things. <coughs> and then, in addition to that, you also have what the next case looks like. What's a parcel of land? Well, he knew what it was with Penn Central. But you get many cases where you have an assembly of separate parts of land, and the question is, could you stop development as the government on some of them, but not all of them? Or you have a unified parcel of land and you divide it up. If the government allows development here, can it block it there on the grounds that you get an investment rate of return? What's the base? The Constitution, Constitution clearly says it's the fair market value of the property that's taken, but all of these analyses now switch it from value to the cost, and the cost for assets that are hold for a very long period of time are far lower than the market value that what's happened. So what you do is you get this rather odd kind of takings law, and what it says is we don't ask what the government takes and force them to pay it. We say in a regulatory concept, if you have something of value that you retain, everything the government takes, it takes for zero price, opening you up to the kinds of political intrigues that I mentioned before. Now this logic starts moving on in cases like Lucas against the South Carolina Coastal Commission, where in fact uh, a house was built, was knocked down, and then the city said you can't build it up again. And the explanation that was originally given is, well, the vacant land is wonderful for tourism. <coughs> and then somebody says, you know, tourism is a wonderful public use, but you've got to pay when you take something for a public use. So all of a sudden, the justification is, well, this is a storm prevention device. You build a house, it could blow up in the middle of the storm and land on a beach. To which Justice Scalia quite sensibly asked, does that mean we could rip down every house that's up in the name of storm prevention and give no compensation to anybody for anything? And so they just didn't come up with a coherent answer as to what should be done with the economic wipeout. And again, in order to get to this particular result, what they tried to do is to appeal to a notion of reasonable expectations. And it was a notion of reasonable expectations that quite simply does not work. And so you start with the following notion. And you say, look, you bought land, and you bought this land in an environment at a time in which massive regulation by the government has generally been part and parcel of the rest of the world. So when you decide to enter into this particular world, you basically have assumed the risk, since you're on notice, that the regulation that is applied to other people, which may have benefited you or may not, will apply to you as well. And so what they said is you cannot have any reasonable expectations independent of what the law provides. And indeed, the effort to say that we can figure out the use of reasonable expectations in some sense to determine what the legal boundaries are is a mistake. Because once you know what the law is, then the only reasonable expectation you have is you either comply with this thing or something goes wrong with it. Now what happens is that this particular thing, again, 
deviates in a very substantial way from the way in which we start thinking about reasonable expectations and notice in all sorts of other kinds of context. So we take a random member of this particular class and you're walking outside either in Hyde Park or downtown and you're aware in effect that there is some kind of crime risk that is associated with it. So you go out into the street and the fellow who starts mugging you says, look, you know, you have no reasonable expectation of safety uh, because it turns out that there are all sorts of public notices which are telling you that you're at risk. And in fact, if you look carefully on my website, I put up the notice saying I will molest and murder anybody who's on the following street at the following time. You've got fair notice, so stay away from the particular area. And what this does, in effect, is it gives rise to a very profound debate as to why that form of notice is completely different from another form of notice. And the other form of notice is you own a piece of land. There's a risk that you will, of course, sell it first to one person and then to another, and both of them cannot have it. So what the state does is it puts up a bulletin board, said the person who comes first has to put notice on the bulletin board, and then anybody who looks at the bulletin board with notice is protected. Anybody who doesn't sign on to the bulletin board loses. Well, what's the difference between the two cases if there's notice in both of them? Well, I think it's pretty simple. In the first case, notice is a threat. And essentially, the purpose of the notice is to diminish the value and the options of other individuals by asserting the ability to use force against these people at your own free will and pleasure. And if, in fact, the use of force is regarded as a no-no, and I hope that it is, then the threat of force is, in fact, regarded as a no-no. And the threat of force, which is made clear and explicit, is more dangerous in many ways than the implicit threat, which you might understand or you might not understand. So what we do is we essentially have the following rule. We allow the assumption of risk defense to be feeding, feeding off of the notice requirement where it proves the transactional security of people, but not otherwise. And in fact, the bulletin board and the recordation system does exactly that because people will now pay an enhanced price uh, to an owner who's recorded. And since recording is a simple unilateral act that you can do at the time of purchase, virtually everybody who buys property can secure that protection. And all of us are left better off by the security of transactions whether we're in the position of a seller or a buyer or a lender or somebody who's just trying to figure out in order to send around the circular who happens to hold land at any given time. And so what happens in this particular case is we now come up with the usual sort of dilemma that is so often the case in public law. What we do, in effect, is instead of understanding the way in which these various notices of assumption of risk and so forth work, we come up to a situation in which we say, no, it's the bad meaning of the term that dominates. So what's the consequence of that? Well, if you start looking at the Lucas case, what they are worried about is its relationship to the Penn Central case that I talked about before. And in Penn Central case, what happened was there was a residual value that allowed the person to cover the cost of his original investment, and that was thought to be sufficient. In this particular case, if the property is knocked down, do you have any residual values, or is it a, quote, loss of total economic viability under the circumstances? And Justice Scalia, who's not a theorist, he's a Supreme Court justice, he says, I've got an easy case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to solve the easy case, and I'll leave the harder cases for later. Very bad set of institutional intuition. What you want to do when you solve a problem is to figure out not only the train wreck that's in front of you, but the one that's a little bit further down the track. And you don't want to give yourself a doctrine which works for one trip and one trip only and creates endless chaos <coughs> everywhere else you look. But nonetheless, he decides to do this. And he says, you know, I'm thinking about this case. And if you tell somebody that he cannot build on his land, it's tantamount to taking the land in its entirety. Indeed, that is exactly the way in which the trial judge in this case thought about the matter, because what he did was extremely ingenious and very telling. What he said is when he confronted this particular situation is, you know, this land is absolutely worthless for the owner. He has to pay real estate taxes on it. He may be able to play football on the thing, but if a trespasser gets injured, he's still going to be responsible. So its value is probably negative to him, and it's certainly zero. And you want to keep this land locked up in that fashion? You've taken the land for all purposes. So what he ordered the, Mr. Lucas to do is to take the deeds to the property, convey them over to the government. The government then paid the money back to Mr. Lucas, and he used it to pay off the two mortgages and kept the lefty. That is, they said, you want to do something that's tantamount to a taking, it's a taking. 
At which point, the democratic process point that I talked about abstractly in the Penn Central case really comes to bear with great provision. Because you're sitting there in this basic situation in South Carolina, some little island out there. You've just had a hit for $500,000 with respect to this property. And everybody sits there and looks at each other. Is this property worth $500,000 to us? Or would we rather sell this thing off in some way, get the money back, and then use it to repair the beach, which in fact is public property? And if you just put that as a budget choice, there is no conscientious person who would say, we love to keep vacant plots of land near the beach at the same time that the whole thing goes to rack and ruin. And what we would rather do is to raise taxes on everybody else and sell this particular property off. So they passed around for a buy. They found the guy next door who would pay 60% of the value for a side yard. That wasn't enough. So eventually what they did is they sold it off under the exact terms and conditions that it was condemned in the first place. And as Mr. Lucas told me once many years ago, he said, it's a hell of a way to organize a land sale to have this government condemnation, a Supreme Court case, and then resell it for the same use that you started with. I mean, that is not the way in which you do business. But the point is, once in fact they require you to take the property, it then went explicitly on the book. And when it goes explicitly on the book, you then sell it. And if you know that that's going to be the consequence, the next time around, you're not going to do it at all. So Justice Scalia writes a lot. And then again, he starts playing the skeptic game. He says, you know, I really don't understand this area. I don't know what it is to confer a benefit or to prevent a harm. Everybody starts talking in these terms, but it's all in the eyes of the beholder. And of course, that's again a form of linguistic skepticism, which in fact is a palpable absurdity if you start to think about it. So let me give you an illustration. I take my good friend here, Mr. Flieger, right? And I will now prove to you two propositions. One is this man has hurt me grievously at this very moment because I would like $100 and he did not give it to me, right? On the other hand, he has benefited me magnificently because he has it within his brawny power uh, to beat me to a pulp and he's restrained from doing so. And so he has both hurt me and helped me. And indeed, if you look around this room, each of you have hurt and helped each other in exactly the same way. What happens is we don't want to have a transactional nightmare where every time you do or do not do anything, there's a compensation obligation that runs from everybody to everybody else. So we've organized something known as society. And what that society said <laughs> to our good friend Mr. Flieger is you can keep your money and you better keep your hands to yourself. And if I do the same thing, lo and behold, instead of having restitution cases coming out the wazoo and tort cases of equal number, we have neither restitution nor tort. If Mr. Flieger, in fact, saves my bacon when I'm no longer there to attend to it, um, he has provided me with a tangible benefit. I'd be required to compensate him for his cost. If he beats me to a pulp, I can then sue him because that's it. And all of a sudden, you realize that harm and benefit correspond very closely to the traditional common law character categories of tort and restitution. And it proves you once again that the philosopher actually knows a little bit about the legal system will do a lot better than the philosopher or justice who essentially treats it as an abstract problem devoid of any connotation. So in the end, he backs off of that anyhow, but comes up with the following <coughs> untenable law. And he says, if it's a complete wipeout, then we give you full compensation unless you create a nuisance. He's now back in traditional categories. But if it's anything less than that, tuck no. Well, in that case, we knew it was a complete wipeout because they said it. But remember, the next proposition that we talk about is that every local government reads the election returns. Every local government reads the Supreme Court opinions. And if they say, well, we can take 90% or 80% or 99% without paying a dime by way of regulation, why would we ever go the whole hog? <coughs> and so what happens is we then have the following clever cottage industry that develops in which you impose extensive regulations that never, never say you cannot build at all. They just put impossible procedural hoops in the way and substantive regulations. And then, in effect, neighbors can challenge it. And then there could be rezoning hearings and so forth. Or as my late colleague Grant Gilmore used to say, you can kill people with due process by giving them so many <coughs> options that they will never make their way through the end of the maze, which is exactly the strategy that gets adopted. And so what happens is you get all of these cases, and then the question is, what does the Supreme Court start to do in order to untie this Gordian knot? And the answer is a single word, is punt. That is, this problem has come up many, many times in lower courts, all of the Penn Central complications on what is a parcel, what is a reasonable expectation, all the Lucas questions on what is economic viability. And the lower courts continue to wander in the wilderness, and the Supreme Court will not throw them a lifeline. 
And the question you start to ask is why this? And there's a very good reason. It's easy to sort of say that there's a distinction that everybody else has to follow. And it's much more difficult to see whether or not it makes sense or whether it's been a part. And the Supreme Court never wants to get involved in cases which involve a public revelation of the mistaken conceptual structure which they use. And so if you take the Lucas Penn Central synthesis on these kinds of situations, it's been cited in thousands of cases in all sorts of areas. Uh, if I had time, I would tell you how Penn Central has come to rule rate regulation cases, debit card interchange cases, and all the other stuff. And I will simply repeat here a lesson that I make all the time when I teach this to my land use students, some of whom are here, which is if you start with the wrong foot in the wrong direction, it turns out that unless you undo the original mistake, you can't correct for it by doing other kinds of adaptation. So essentially, when you start coming to the real estate area where you have relatively fixed and tangible interests, <coughs> the moment you introduce the notion of reasonable expectations, you're acting in a most unreasonable way. You have a situation in which the property conceptions that are displaced do a much better job with the problem uh, than the substitute framework, which is hoist up on the SS William J. Brand. Now, the next question you have to ask is the other side of this particular problem. Exactly what do we do in this particular world to make sense of reasonable expectations, and where does this particular term start to deal with? And what happens is it has an extremely valuable use in the following kinds of context. You have a joint venture between two parties in which the specific rights and duties have not been spelled out in advance by a complete contingent state contract, sometimes because it's too costly for parties to draft, and in other cases because it's simply an impossibility to do it because the interactions can take place like on a public street between any two people randomly at any time, and just as Mr. Flieger can't enter into a bunch of contracts about not hitting and helping other people in the world, he cannot go to 7 million people in New York and 3 million in Chicago and say, this is the way we would like to do things in terms of our cooperation. And what the doctrine of reasonable expectations is designed to do is to tell each party the way in which he has to behave, such that if the other fellow behaves in a complementary fashion, uh, the situation will be optimal for both of them. And so this is far from just being an ad hoc kind of notion. It's a way in which you try to secure optimal cooperation between people when the level of transactions costs that involve with them are very high. So let me give you a kind of an illustration as to how this thing will work. And you can see where it's going to go fairly quickly. Let's suppose you're sitting outdoors in Central Park. And you're sitting here and somebody else is sitting here. Well, what are the reasonable expectations that we have? Well, for the first thing, most of us have some desire to keep a certain degree of privacy. And so we would regard it as very inappropriate for somebody to be sitting here and spending the whole time going like this. Well, tell me what you want, but this conversation over here is more interesting than that. And so what we do is we have essentially an anti-eavesdropping rule that we apply. And not only do we apply it there, we apply it in restaurants. It's a lot harder to do in New York City, where the tables are close together because the real estate prices are on. And it's a little bit easier to do in Chicago, where we have decent spacing under these things. And it's perfectly reciprocal. You don't eavesdrop over the other guy. The other guy doesn't eavesdrop over you. But is that the only set of expectations we have? No. Uh, it turns out that we have another set of expectations, which is you don't talk so loud that I can't help but eavesdrop to you whether I want to or not. And so what we do is we develop this phrase, which we call conversational tone. That doesn't mean the way I speak, because that never seems to fit. My wife is always telling me, don't do this. And so forth. But the basic point is we're trying to get an equilibrium in which the limitations that you impose across the board with respect to how you speak and the limitations that you impose across the board on how you listen will, in fact, prove the maximize the flow of conversation with people whom you want to talk to and minimize the flow of conversation with everybody else. Now, these are general expectations. And this is a rather large and unruly crowd that we're starting to talk about. And so the question is, can you individuate, or do you to individuate these kinds of rules? And the answer is very complicated. So to give you but another example, every time I go out with my daughter, she starts to talk about a business, she says, we can't talk about that. Somebody made me listen. You know, she's got a point. And so what happens is, if you want to talk about your business deal, if you want to give your projections to what the stock market's going to look like, whether a merge is going to take place, you know, go into a public restaurant. 
the information is too valuable. And so what you do is you find a private dining hall, one of these fancy clubs, in which you can shut the dog and talk in relative privacy. So that what happens when you're dealing with reasonable expectations is that you understand that they cover the vast amount of routine transactions, but with idiosyncratic transactions, it turns out that you have to do something else in some other way. Now, what further happens in these cases is these expectations are developed in many cases because of interactions casual and repetitive over large numbers of times with all sorts of random people of very different backgrounds. And then the question is what you do is you put a landlord on top of it. So you're not doing this in a park, you're now doing it in a restaurant. And what you will find typically under these circumstances is that most restaurants will say, you know, whatever maximizes the conversations between people in a public park will tend to do it here, and so that we'll kind of be the enforcer on this thing. So instead of having to yell at the guy next door, you ask the rater, you tell those people to calm down a little bit or not to lean over and the rest of it. Couples to the same kind of situation. There's certain things for which you get private rooms because the public space is simply not going to give you the kind of protection that you need given the value of the distinctive nature of the conversation in question. So all of this stuff is reasonable expectations. And then the question is how firm and how systematic do we turn out that these expectations to be? And one of the common features that you get when you start teaching law school is that when you introduce a notion like this, the linguistic skeptic always takes precedent over somebody who observes the social practice. And so what I would ask you to do is when you think about this, is that now that I've articulated the norm, announce to yourself that you really have never followed it during the course of your life, or that now that you know what the norm is, you've decided that it's oppressive for this, that, or the other reason, and you'd like to switch to some other norm. And what you discover when, I won't do it here because it's too risky, um, when you actually ask people about this, once you articulate the norm, it turns out that it has tremendous adherence, and the only way that you even know it's a norm is when you actually have to enforce it in the few cases where there's some kind of deviation from it. Now the question is, what does this tell us about jurisprudence? Well, the answer is it tells us a hell of a lot. And what it tells us, in effect, is that the method that I've talked about here, you see people make these kind of adaptations in frequent, low-level, simultaneous interactions and come up with a fairly powerful equilibrium, that's the origins of natural law. That is, if you want to go back in my Roman law class, I see a couple of them hanging around here, uh, what they started to do is they were natural lawyers in the sense that they just observed the way people work, then they tried to extract from the observations the implicit norms by which they did it, then they tell the norms to the people so that they can then use them to resolve the more difficult cases that come up up and down the line. And the case that I just gave you is the relatively simple one in which you can deal with because it's low-level interactions over broad populations and so forth. The question you then have to ask is whether or not the notion of reasonable expectations that we want to put into place here can carry itself in other kinds of situations. And let me, in effect, now try to show how it comes to use in the commerce case. Now, one of the great cases in common law is a case called Nicholson Rainbridge from 1615. It was actually in the Baird case book. That one. And the question is, why is it important? Well, one of the things that you have to deal with in the law of contract is to organize exchanges. One of the problems you worry about is whether or not there's an agreement between the two parties as to what is to be exchanged and for what. And the other problem, which I'm going to talk about here, went in Hobbesian terms, was known as the assurance problem, which is the question, how do we know if I perform that you're going to perform? Because if it turns out that you don't have a secure return performance coming out of these situations, you will never take the first step. And if you don't take the first step, the other guy won't take the first step. And if neither of you will start to take the first step, what's going to happen? There'll be no transactions except absolutely simultaneous exchanges, which means that gains from trade are going to be sharply constructed. So what you then have to do is to figure out what are the rules with respect to these sorts of exchanges. And the standard rule with respect to the provision of a single good to a single customer, which is a very common case, right, extremely important, but by no means the whole magnitude, is that neither guy has to go first. What you do is each person has to say to the other, I'm ready, willing, and able to perform. And in effect, if you are not ready, willing, and able to perform, then it's going to be a breach. 
And so in the typical case, both announce themselves ready, willing, and able, and then both perform, and the simultaneity condition is the way in which you avoid the assurance problem of having somebody go first and somebody come second. And if you ask yourself how many of you knew or ever heard of the expression concurrent conditions before you came to law school, I would say that the odds are pretty good that none of you have ever heard of it at all. And there's no reason why you have to be able to understand it in that fashion. What is critical is that when you engage in these kinds of exchanges, you understood that. Now, do you apply that rule in all cases? Well, of course not. But then you start drawing distinctions. If these are transactions with strangers whom you may not see again, then the assurance problem is much riskier. If they're you know, arrangements with friends, sure, I'll lend you the pen if you give it back to me tomorrow because we've got all the social hooks that are on you. And so what you then do is you develop a set of reasonable expectations about not only how you execute simultaneous exchanges, but the way in which you can create environments in which sequential exchanges can still be done, increase the possibilities for gains from trade without running into a serious risk with respect to the assurance problem. Now, can we do this in any other way? Well, suppose we start dealing with genuinely asymmetrical type situations where this notion of reasonable expectations seems to me to have enormous importance. And here what I will do is I will start with some product liability cases. If you go back and you read a case called the Skoll against the Coca-Cola Company back in 1944, what you do is you see a very well-known concurring opinion by Justice Roger Trainer announcing that he's going to use a strict product liability rule, which most people have hailed as a revolution in the way in which we think about the subject uh, from the previous negligence system all of which is basically an urban folk tale. Uh, this was a concurring opinion. The original opinion was one which said, oh, we have a defect. It exploded in ordinary use. We use res ipsa locator to get us to the place that we want. And you don't get revolutions when concurring opinions come out with exactly the same result as original conditions. But it's even more than that. Most people, when they read this case, they read everything through to the last paragraph. But the last paragraph is the one which essentially stabilizes expectations between parties. What it says, in effect, is the strict liability rule applies only to a product in its original condition. It cannot be altered by intermediate parties. And it must be put to its normal and proper use by a particular plaintiff. Notice, in effect, normal and proper is a highly normative kind of concept. You can foresee all sorts of stupid things that people are going to do, but you're only designed to protect them for normal and proper use. Now, why is this appropriate? Because you've got an asymmetrical case, and somebody presents you with a problem, say a can of Coke, which is what was at issue in Escola. And normal and proper use means that you can open it and drink it. Not so normal and not proper use means that you could play touch football in the back of the stall with the can, have the carbonation go absolutely <coughs> and then see the thing explode upon you. And so what you do with normal and proper use is essentially what you're saying is this guy has a strong expectation to give you a product which doesn't contain a latent defect, if he provides you with that, your part of the deal is to use it for the purpose for which it was intended. And you know, in Coke bottles it applies. When you start getting with surgical instruments, exactly the same column applies. You cannot give a surgical into, you know, instrument to some random person and say, just cut anybody open. What you have to do is to give it to people with extensive training, and the reference of safety to the product is with respect to use by the approved class of individuals in the required manner. If you don't do that, you cannot design a product that's effective, because if you have to protect against the misuses by dunderheads and dolts, then in effect you destroy the efficiency of the product in question. Basically, the rule is uh, the greater the skill of the operator, the fewer the built-in safeguards with respect to its operation. You rely on human judgment to control things rather than built-in constraint. If you're dealing with situations where, in fact, operators are less skilled, all of a sudden you do build in safeguards, uh, guards that prevent machine tools from coming down on hands, and so forth. But what you want to do is to create these kinds of situations, and it's a full information game. You tell them the way the thing works, and you tell them what their safe path of usage is. If they like it, they take it. If they don't like it, they don't take it. And it turns out that second threat is very serious, and dangerous products don't get sold. And so if you look in the period before Escola, massive improvement in product safety starts to take place. None of it dependent upon the law, all of it dependent upon this interactive situation. I give you a better product that gives you greater flexibility of use at lower risk. At an equal price, you're going to take that product as opposed to the miserable product that somebody else did. Now, what happens is the modern law decides that a uh, better idea is 
Don't look to the question of normal and proper. Look to the question of foreseeable use, indeed foreseeable misuse. And so what happens is no longer are you trying to optimize uh, the distribution between the two parties. What you're trying to say to one guy is you are the better cost avoider up and down this situation. You have to take all the precautions precisely because the other guy may well take none. And so when you start building your cars, it's not a question of meeting external standards. It's a question of building something so if he drives drunk 90 miles an hour into an iron pylon, you may well, if a jury decides, uh, be responsible because you could have had a cost-effective solution. And so what you do is you go back to the central planning mode that you see in all these land use cases. And after the fact, the juries are now entitled to decide one way or another what it is they like to do. It is a classic illustration of basically getting rid of a model which treats reasonable expectations as a way of joint optimization of parties in asymmetrical positions to say, in effect, we know as judicial czars what the better solution is, and we'll run. Now, I'll just spend one more minute, and the other area you have to see this working in is, of course, uh, the Fourth Amendment. Because we talked about snooping, if you recall, a moment ago. Now just change the snooper uh, from an ordinary curious citizen to an FBI agent who's sitting at the table next to you. And what happens is the Supreme Court is quite right to say that trespasses generally always are a prima facie search, which may or may not be justified, but the eavesdropping cases cannot be excluded from Fourth Amendment protection precisely because they give the invasion of privacy of the sort that we talked about. And so the lesson that you get here, if you want to follow it through, is when you're trying to make your way through complicated constitutional areas, if you know the private relationships between ordinary individuals, you see how the notion of privacy plays out in that particular notion context. You see how the notions of cooperation played out. That's the template for using these things in the public area. So what we've done is we've finished the circle. We start off with a series of expectations which are profoundly unreasonable because they're separated from a system of property law and they bear no relationship to the agency of cooperation. And then what we do is we go to an area where, in fact, there is reasonable expectations precisely because what the law is now trying to do is to understand how people maximize their joint welfare through cooperative behavior. You want to keep the latter, you want to forget the former, and then you want to ask any questions you have. Thank you. I will now take my first breath. Anybody have a question? Anyone have a good question? Yes, sir. Go for it. Could you say a little bit more, more about reasonableness in nuisance? Because I'm thinking, you know, if, if regulatory taking is indeed classic taking, I don't think we really see a more democratic system. What we see is an elevated use of nuisance. And essentially, we're letting judges, who are not any more democratic than the government, to decide about what is reasonable use between this land. Can you build this high? Can you do this? Ah, uh, well, you see, you, you have to know the law. And what you're doing is you're working off an inexact view of the way in which it developed. If you want a systematic and complete view, I wrote an article about nuisance law, corrective justice, and its utilitarian constraints uh, before you were born. <laughs> 1979, Eight General Legal Studies, page 49. Um, I cite it because I refer to it so much in my own life. And, and nuisance law, in fact, has a very complicated use of the term reasonableness. And let me give you what the basic ambiguity is and how I would resolve it. One view of nuisance law and reasonableness is that you import the Carroll towing formula, the hand formula, asking about the level of benefits and the expected harms, and then balance it off that way. And it's not only that judges have an enormous difficulty in trying to do this, juries have an enormous difficulty in trying to do this. And so the strongest attack on the hand formula in stranger cases, as opposed to cooperative cases, right, the distinction again is, is that nobody knows how to do this in a public sphere. You want private actors to make those determinations. You present them with a price sheet which says, you pollute somebody else, this is what you're going to have to pay. They'll figure out what the optimal level of precautions are one way or the other. If they go too far off the reservation, like they decide it's perfectly OK to kill a neighborhood by making cyanide in a house, then we shut them down for abnormal dangerous activities. And that's the way in which that ought to work. The nuisance law has the same thing. One of the early cases says uh, the, just of, the utility of the activity justifies the noise in this della stick. And that's the kind of cost-benefit analysis that I think is completely dangerous and you don't want to make. Uh, if you go back and read the cases on this, there's a nice article in the Columbia Law Review from 2012 by 
Gergen and Smith and Golden, I guess. I can't remember who. And what they do is they say, historically, it never really worked that way. Well, what happened essentially was the benefits that somebody got were ignored. If it was a substantial risk, you enjoined it full stop. No excuse. So you use the strict liability rule to avoid it. Now, the reason reasonableness starts to come into play is that the size of a nuisance and the distribution of a nuisance is not like that of the typical running down tort. You have many, many people. Some of them have little pollution on their neighbors. So every time I talk, it's noise pollution. Every time I light my barbecue, it's smoke pollution. You do the same thing. So Baron Bramwell, in a case called Bamford against Turnley, basically announced the live and let live rule. And he said, for low-level reciprocal interferences, we are better off ignoring them in both directions. And it's exactly the analogy with my Flieger example, right? Which is, I'm making a 1,000 of these things a day. You are making a 1,000 things of these a day. We're each better off if the harm is very small in letting them all ride because we're pretty confident that the aggregate benefit is going to be high. Now, when you then check this against the internalization mechanism, how do these things work where you have a single owner, what you discover is that people are very sensitive to this, even more so than the nuisance law. So to give you but one illustration, when do you allow construction in a condominium, which is a nuisance, right? Well, you can't stop it entirely, because if you do that, uh, what's clearly going to happen is nobody will ever be able to improve their units, and you won't be able to sell them. So what you do is you limit the kinds of tools you can bring into the place, and you limit the times that you can do it. And amazingly enough, you do it during the workday, after 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, you don't do it in the middle of the night where you're going to keep everybody awake. And so reasonableness essentially becomes the highest level of reciprocal interaction that works for the mutual benefit of both parties. Now, if you go to an industrial district, it turns out that those numbers are always higher than they are in a residential district. The difficulties come up when you deal with smoke that travels from one kind of district to another, or from a high-polluting state to a low-polluting state. So if you think of it in that particular fashion, then the optimization pattern works because you're worried about reciprocal, <coughs> low-level nuisances. That's the definition of reasonable. It's not the relationship of course to benefit. And if you sort that thing out, you'll be OK. If you make the mistake, everything that's wrong with the hand formula in the accident cases are not going to be cured when you take it to this particular case. OK, another question? Somebody? What is wrong with you? Oh, oh, question. Oh, Mr. Sasta. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, look, this is, you know, Ronald is now dead, right? <laughs> um, he, is, he is the most amazing man. Um, God was a, basically a man of ordinary intelligence who was an absolute genius. Um, and he never understood his own theory. I mean, this is a serious problem, okay? <laughs> um, and let me see if I can explain to you what it was. You talk to Ronald, particularly, he stopped writing in 1975. And, you know, at this point, it's the most cited article in the face of Western civilization and so forth. The closest to us were Keynes or Friedman or to the general world. And Ronald said, these people, they all misunderstand me. All I was trying to do is to figure out how you deal with nuisance cases like Sturgis and Richmond between two neighbors. And now they apply this principle to all sorts of strange areas like corporate transactions to which they have no relevance at all. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, what am I going to do with this one? Um, I mean, in fact, the last conversation I had with Ronald just before he died, I mean, it just, he was sitting there, and he was announcing that he was a failure. I said, well, why are you a failure, Ronald? He says, because I never got people to understand the correct implications of my own. And I just looked at him. I said, Ronald, if your name becomes an adjective, you ain't a failure, you're a success. And so long as cosine is part of the vocabulary, you've done something. And so what happens is to everybody else in the world, what Ronald was talking about was the way in which you start to think about externalities and such in high transactions course world. And let me tell you what the ambiguity is that he faces and a lot of other people face, because it's one that we talk about in land use plan. The question is if you have a single owner who owns everything at the outset and then creates a distribution of rights and benefits amongst individuals within a subdivision, whether there's anything that you would want to call an external. And the answer to that question is no. Because everybody who's in this particular setting will in fact consent at one level or another to the restrictions that are imposed because the whole system of covenants 
that you use when you start to sell land means that everybody who takes notice with the uh, benefits and burdens to other individuals are bound by them. This is the good version of notice. It's not the thuggery version of notice. And what happens is, it turns out that you impose very heavy restrictions on certain kinds of activities that are not nuisances. That's fine. And then you allow certain nuisance-like activities to increase, but not too many of them. And since everybody's consented, it's there. Now, this is not a zero transactions cost world, but it's a closed universe. And what happens is you organize it in a way to minimize the transactions cost downstream as you have to run this thing over a long period of time. But now, let's suppose you've got a bunch of individuals who do not have a common owner, as in all the cases that he talked about, most notably something like Sturgis against Bridge. That's the case where the person is doing his asphaltation, very sensitive, and the guy next door is the apothecary, right? The apothecary got there first and makes all sorts of noise, and the other guy can't do it. So obviously, you've got an interaction that's between the two of them. And what happens is now, since there wasn't a common owner, you have to figure out how you're going to adjust this thing. First approximation that everybody comes up with is the one I hinted at in the client. All things equal, you pollute your neighbor, it's trouble. And so now the definition of an externality is a nuisance because you don't have the built-in consent. And if you just sort of do it as a first approximation, you think you're better off with a nuisance law or no nuisance law, even you, Mr. Sass, would say better to have a nuisance law. So when Ronald won the Nobel Prize, it was a wonderful conversation. Um, he's sitting off in the middle of Zanzibar or something, or Marrakesh. And so we put together a panel at the law school to talk about costs. And you can imagine trying to explain what a transactions cost universe is to a bunch of reporters. But they want to see how you're going to save the world. And finally, in a moment of desperation sitting on this panel, I said, Ronald really believes there's nothing wrong with pollution. And they all look at Nobel Prize for idiocy is what they would think. How could that possibly be? And of course, what Ronald meant by that is if you have a single owner, it may well be better that you allow certain pollution on the one side and then take precautions on the other than to allow no nuisance to be created at all. And therefore, if you run the separation between two people, the same solution might well be appropriate because what he doesn't want is the primacy of causation to take place. But everybody else does the following. They say, look, a good approximate, we're trying to get approximations to correct adjustments between neighbors. Stopping nuisance is a very good first approximation. But then there are complications. The live and let live rule is one that we just talked about, right? The one that you do. And all of a sudden you say, you know, by the way, we make this adjustment, it's fine. And it was the libertarian judges, Baron Bramwell, who figured this out. Now the next problem that you get is with the coming to the nuisance issue. And there's another real stinker that's thrown into the case. And Ronald did not see it, and the economists never worry about it, which is the temporal gap. And so, who comes first? And what George Jessel, who's a great judge, says is this. You commit a nuisance, and it goes on somebody else's empty plot of land. Is that a tort? And the answer is, of course it's a tort. It's an invasion. Is it something you want to stop? Well, don't be crazy. There's no home on the one side. The land is vacant. And this is noise, right? So it's not as though you've ruined the soil. And so forth. There's a huge benefit on the other side. Let it grind. Well, then the problem, he said, is if I let it ride and it is a nuisance, that means the statute of limitations is going to run before the other guy starts to build. He says, not in my court. What I'm going to do is to say that the statute of limitations is told, that is suspended, until the conflicting use starts to arise, at which point it starts to run. So the guy gets the run of the field until the neighbor comes in. Once the neighbor comes in, then it's a standard nuisance type case. And then he finishes the story by saying, look, I never read Calabrese and Mohammed. I'm not going to say it's either injunctions or damages. I'm going to give you a little of both. So he gives them some time to disassemble their equipment and to move it away, and then enjoins the operation. And that has always been what the law is. And if you're now trying to measure efficiency over a temporal period, it's going to get it exactly right. Um, or if not exactly right, as close as you can get it, given the fact that you're dealing with inconsistent preferences by two people with respect to use of a joint asset, the air, or whatever. So the nuisance law is extremely sensitive to these kinds of things. And the key feature for doing law and economics, or takings law, is to understand those variations and understand why they're right. So does this become a constitutional issue? Of course it does. It's a case called how to check against Sebastian. And the question is, what do we do with the coming to the nuisance defense um, when somebody wants to shut down a piggery after the residential district comes up? Do you play the statute of limitations on it or not? And they say, in effect, 
Well, you really do allow the injunction following Sturgis and Bruce, from which other people then say, like Justice Brennan, well, it's obviously clear that you have huge discretion in the way in which you organize the shared benefits and burdens of life, and since that's the case, the legislature has to be given carte blanche to do what it wants. But if you follow the logic that our good friend Jessel had, much more constrained than that, and you could get a narrow rationale which will defend the outcome in Sebastian, how to check on Sebastian, without saying that you can do whatever you want whenever it turns out that you want. And so that's the way you have to start to explain this stuff. And I have to tell you, the last economics conference I was at, um, the man named Terry Anderson, he kept on saying, I hate the E word, I, the externality word, because he confused the two situations of single owner and distribution of multiple entitlements with the stranger interaction case. And Coach does not make that particularly clear, because when he talks about this, he talks about reciprocal causation, which is correct if there's a single owner, but it doesn't capture what you want when you start with two people with separate entitlements. In the end, you will make adjustments for extra sensitive uses and so forth. And in that line of cases that starts with, um, what shall I call it, with Sturgis and Bridgman, a uh, case called Robertson and Kilbert does exactly that for extra sensitive uses inside a building and so forth. So the English judges were tremendously good and the Americans weren't bad at all. The problem with modern law and economics is it has so little interest in doctrine that when you actually see relevant distinctions to the economics, okay, when you read the cases carefully, they will miss it. Time for one more quick question or I'll just go. Somebody? Oh yes, my dear Miss Perry. Uh, <laughs> so if you're letting it uses with the pipeline of different speaking. Yeah. Do we let that vary by state? Do we let states change what you Ah, a great question. The answer about this is yes and no, right? And this is what the problem is. That is, if in fact what you do is you say that state law determines the substrate on which the constitutional work works, then the question is what can the state do? And this gets to the issue of judicial and legislative takings. Suppose what we do now is we pass a statute, okay, Ms. Perry? And what we announce is that anybody who looks out to his neighbor's property has committed a nuisance. And so therefore, he put high walls and all the rest of that stuff. And I think what most people would start to say, where in the world do they do that? And what happens is at some point, the state legislation itself becomes a taking with respect to what's going on. So to give you another illustration, and this does happen, I'm very hostile to those people in the EPA and others say, well, there's a lot of pollution out there. We're going to make a deal which lets them continue for a good long time because we think it's in the social interest, and this other guy has to take it in the chops. My view is, if in fact you make those legislative deals, that the legislative variations are taken. So this gets you back to the common law. And with respect to the common law, the good news is that the variation on these doctrines among states, given restatements and everything else, is stunningly small. But if you start getting some yokel state that's going to do something really dangerous, then in a federal system, you get the judicial takings doctrine, uh, the Stop the Beach Renourishment case, which all of you should read, because what you discover there is Justice Scalia has no idea what we mean by an avulsion, as we talked about in class. That is, avulsion is a sudden change of a river by natural forces, and he thinks that a deliberate alteration of its course is the same thing as an accidental one, and decides the case accordingly. And so you have to basically beware of the fact that there is an envelope in the common law where you can move. And so to give you the famous Holmes example, if somebody says, you know, you can build a fence, a fence six feet high to stop neighbors from prying in, right, and you ban them from building it 20 feet high, and what's going on there is you're protecting privacy in the one case and obscuring views in the other, and the average reciprocity of advantage says stop the high state. So you can vary the common law rule by statute, but you're always looking for mutual improvements when you do that. And all the cases that talk about this say, ah, there is a real improvement here, but they never ask how it's distributed. And if you go through defense cases and the air rights cases and so forth, they all fit into the same problem. So it's the right question to ask, but there is a right answer to it. Okay, thank you all. Get the class.